Hey friends, this is Elijah here. Welcome to part 2 of Typical Embed Systems. In the last video, we saw that the Typical Embed System can be composed of 6 parts, out of which we discussed the first 3, that is, the core, the memory, and sensors and actuators. In this video, we'll talk in detail about different communication interfaces, about embedded firmware, and then further other system components. Let us dive into communication interface. Communication interface is essential for communicating with various subsystems of the embedded system and with the external world. Now, the communication interface can be divided into two major sections. Device or board level communication interfacing, that is onboard communication interface, or product level communication interface, that is external communication interface. Serial interfaces like I2C, SPI, UART, OneWire, etc. And parallel bus interfaces are examples of onboard communication interface. Whereas infrared and Bluetooth, wireless LAN, radio frequency, RF waves, GPRS, etc., are examples of external interfacing. As we talk about onboard communication interfaces, the first communication interface that comes is I2C bus. The I2C bus was invented by Philips in the early 1980s. It is a multi master, multi slave protocol. The devices connected to the I2C bus can act as either the master device or slave device. The master device is responsible for controlling the communication by initiating or terminating the data transfer, sending data and generating necessary synchronization clock pulses. The slave devices wait for the commands from the master and respond upon receiving the commands. Master and slave devices can act as either transmitter or receiver. Since there is a master and it creates the clock. It is a synchronous mode of communication. Since the master and slave both can act as either transmitter or receiver, it's a bidirectional communication. It is a half duplex communication, which means at either time, communication or data can be transformed from one side to the other. It is also a two wire protocol. The original intention of the I2C was to provide an easy way of communicating between the microprocessor or microcontroller system and the peripheral chips in a television set. Now, the standard I2C is commonly used between communicating peripheral ICs with the microcontroller. The next protocol is UART, which stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Now, this is an asynchronous form of serial data transmission. That means that it does not require a clock signal to synchronize the transmitting end and the receiving end for transmission. Instead, it relies upon predefined agreement between the transmitting device and receiving device. The serial communication setting like baud rate, number of bits per byte, parity, number of start bits, number of stop bits and flow control for both the transmitter and receiver should be set as identical. Moving ahead, the next protocol we find is the serial peripheral interface bus. This was introduced by Motorola and SPI as it is known is a single master multi-sleeve system. It is possible to have a system where more than one device can be a master, provided the condition only one master device is active at any given point of time. SPI is also synchronous and SPI the master is responsible for, for providing the clock. The communication is bidirectional that is both the devices can communicate and since it is full duplex both the devices can communicate at the same time. It is also a 4-wire serial protocol. The 1-wire interface developed by Maxim Della Semiconductor is an asynchronous half-duplex communication protocol. It makes use of only a single wire for communication and follows the master-slave communication model. One of the key features of the 1-wire bus is that it allows power to be sent along the signal wire as well. The final onboard interface that we discuss is parallel interface which is normally used for communicating with peripheral devices which are memory mapped to the host of the system. The communication through the parallel bus is controlled by control signals interfaced between the device and the host. The control signals for communicating includes read-write signal and device select signal. For parallel communication, strict timing characteristics are followed and the parallel communication is always initiated by the host processor. Let's move and see what the external communication protocols are. Our first stop here is the RS-232 or the RS-445 protocol. 
This was developed by the Electronics Industries Association during the early 1960s. This protocol extends the UART, which means that it follows full duplex and asynchronous kind of communication. The pin connectors used for these kind of protocols is either the DB9 pin or the DB25. Next we have Bluetooth, which is a low cost, low power, short range, wireless technology for data and voice communication. It was first proposed by Ericsson in 1994 and operates at 2.4 GHz of radio frequency spectrum. It supports a data rate of up to 1 Mbps and a range of approximately 30 feet for data communication. Next we have Zigbee, which is a low power, low cost, wireless network communication based on the IEEE 802.15.4 2006 standard. It is targeted for low power, low data rate and secure applications for wireless personal area networking, also called as WPAN. It supports an operating distance of up to 100 meters and data rates that vary from 20 to 250 kbps. Wi-Fi or wireless fidelity is the popular wireless communication technique for networked communication of devices. Wi-Fi follows the IEEE 802.11 standard. Wi-Fi is intended for network communication and it supports internet protocol that is IP based communication. It operates at a range of 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz of radio spectrum and they coexist with other ISM band devices like Bluetooth. USB or Universal Serial Bus is a wired high speed serial bus for data communication. The first version of USB, that is USB 1.0, was released in 1995 and was created by the USB core group members consisting of Intel, Microsoft, IBM, Compaq, Digital, and Northern Telecom. The USB communication system follows a star topology with a USB host at the center and one or more USB peripheral devices or USB hosts connected to it. A USB host can support connections up to 127, including safe peripheral devices and other USB hosts. Infrared Infrared is a serial half-duplex, line-of-sight based wireless technology for data communication between devices. It is generally used in remote controls of TVs, VCD players, etc. It supports point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint communication, provided all devices involved in the communication are within the line of sight. The typical communication range of infrared lies in the range of 10 cm to 1 m. The next protocol is GPRS, which stands for General Packet Radio Service. It's a communication technique for transferring data over a mobile communication network like GSM. The transmitting device splits the data into several related packets. At the receiving end, the data is reconstructed by combining the received data packets. The maximum transfer rate of 171.2 kbps exists. Instead of dedicating a radio channel to a cell phone user, the radio channel is concurrently shared between several different users. The IEEE 1394 is a wired isochronous high-speed serial communication bus. It is also known as High Performance Serial Bus, HPSB. The research on 1394 was started by Apple Incorporated in 1985 and the standard for this was coined by IEEE. The 1394 standard supports a data rate of 400 to 3200 megabits per second. It supports peer-to-peer -peer connection and point-to-multipoint communication allowing up to 63 devices to be connected on the bus in a tree topology. The 1394 is a wired serial interface and it can support a cable length of up to 15 feet for interconnection. With these, we have finished talking about communication interfaces, both on-board, that is device level, and external, that is board level. Let us move on to embedded firmware. Any embedded system can be broadly said to be composed of hardware and software, or firmware. The code or program for the firmware can further be written down in assembly or embedded C. Assembly code is fast, processor dependent, and is written down using specific instruction set for the core. Embedded C, on the other hand, for the most part is standard code, with a few variations that depend on the processor used. An embedded C code can easily be transformed from one processor to another. The compiler used for the core has the responsibility of converting the C code into machine level language that the core can understand. Further on, 
This embedded C code can adopt two major styles of programming, super loop or scheduler. In a super loop, the programming tasks are done one after the other in a big infinite loop. Whereas in a scheduler that is implemented either by a general purpose operating system or a real time operating system, tasks are scheduled based on different priority levels. When a higher priority task needs resources, the OS can preempt or stop the lower priority task and allocate resources to the higher priority task. We will be looking deeper into embedded firmware in a future video. Other system components. Many a times while focusing on the major components of a typical embedded system, the other auxiliary systems are taken for granted. But in the true sense, without them, the embedded system as a whole would fail. A few of them are talked about here. Reset circuit. The ability to restart a system is of enormous value. For most cores, the power is supposed to be taken out for a few milliseconds to allow the core to reset. This is done generally by discharging a capacitor quickly. The time it takes to charge is the blackout region. Even during development stage, one would want to reset the circuit multiple times. Brownout protection circuit. When the supply to the core fluctuates, it's called a brownout. During such times, the core may malfunction and produce unpredictable results. The brownout protection circuit protects the core from going into such states. Real-time clock. Real-time clock, also called as RTC, is a clock that keeps track of current time. Many embedded systems need to keep accurate time and the RTC helps in the same. Oscillator unit. The instruction execution of a microprocessor or microcontroller occurs in sync with a clock signal. It is analogous to the heartbeat of a living being, which synchronizes the execution of life. The oscillator unit, which is made up of quartz crystals and ceramic resonators, do that for an embedded system. Watchdog timer. A watchdog timer is a hardware timer for monitoring the firmware execution. At every clock pulse, the watchdog counter is incremented or decremented. In normal execution, the code resets the counter and doesn't allow it to overflow or underflow. But in abnormal conditions, the code cannot reset it and the counter overflows. This resets the code and puts it back into normal operation. So the watchdog timer acts as a fail-safe and prevents the embedded system from malfunctioning. With this, we end our talk about a typical embedded system. In summary, we have talked about core, memory, sensors and actuators, communication interfaces, embedded firmware, and other system components. If you liked this video, it would mean a lot if you give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel to receive notifications about new uploads. Have a great day. This is me, Elijah, signing off.